So folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Chris Neidl. I am one of the co-founders of Open Air. Really excited about today's webinar that we're presenting to you. Uh, this is one of uh, Open Air's new policy initiatives, although it's been in the works now for several months. Uh, this is the Luxembourg Negative Emissions Tariff which I'm really excited. My partner in this is uh, the Honorable Sven Clement, uh, who's a member of the Luxembourg Parliament, uh, who has been developing this policy with Open Air. For more information about Open Air, you can go to openaircollective.cc. A little bit about us. Uh, we're a completely distributed uh, volunteer-based network that's focused on advancing carbon dioxide removal uh, solutions uh, on a global level. Uh, we're entirely distributed. Uh, our community uh, connects and collaborates on the Discord platform, and uh, we'll drop a, a link to our, our join button if you're interested in getting involved. And uh, you can see there just a, a, a sort of a sample of some of the policies that we're uh, currently engaged in. If you follow Open Air, you'll be familiar with them. Um, but the Luxembourg uh, negative emissions tariff is the fourth uh, in policies that have been entirely developed by our community through research from our community. And so we're really excited. This is also the first European uh, originating policy um, that Open Air has put forward. So very excited about that. Uh, I'm just going to pause for a second. I want my uh, partner here and really the, the hero of the story who's who's really leading in this initiative, whose vision is really responsible for us to, to just welcome us. Hey, Sven, how you doing? Yeah. Hey, Chris. Um, hey, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. Um, here in Luxembourg, it's already a bit later than um, in the US. So... We are already uh, 7 p.m. I'm very happy, grateful for everybody to be here. I know that uh, you take some time out of your busy schedules to listen to some uh, crazy people talk about new policy initiatives, uh, this time in Europe, which might not be your wheelhouse, but uh, nonetheless, um, I stumbled across um, uh, CDR um, a bit by chance. I have to say by chance, not by hazard because um, I was looking into uh, the la latest IPCC report and um, they concluded that we can't simply reduce carbon emissions and we actually also need to take action in um, taking out carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, and then it, I started to dig in and uh, somehow I found Chris and the Open Air Collective, uh, we clicked and uh, we decided to work on a policy proposal I intend to bring in front of Parliament in February or March this year um, to introduce a negative um, uh, emissions uh, tariff in, in Luxembourg so that we get something like a feed-in tariff for uh, solar to uh, use the same principles and uh, use it for carbon removal. Um, we had some very interesting discussions over the last um, weeks, months, um, how to do that. And I think today it's um, the time to show you what we came up with, how we plan to do it. And then uh, we'll see um, how you react and uh, which questions we still need to um, answer before um, writing the actual uh, law proposal. Um, that's a bit uh, what I wanted to say. Thank you again for uh, being here. And uh, back to you, Chris. Great, thank you. And you'll be hearing from Sven uh, after the presentation. And again, fortunately, we are recording this session. So everybody attending right now will get a recorded copy as well as those folks uh, who are not able to join. Um, so just some background on what our agenda is for today. As Sven said, we've been developing this policy idea in sort of an interesting way through a, a, a method that we call the collective intelligence relay. And we want you all to be a part of that. And uh, your idea is to, to contribute, not just today on the webinar, but as we'll explain through a platform uh, that we've developed that will allow you to comment on the idea and also provide your own ideas. Um, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna start off, give a little bit of a rationale uh, for the policy, big picture around CDR very briefly. And then what the objectives are of this mission and specifically of the policy and the process that we've used uh, this collective intelligence relay to get us to where we are uh, right now. And then we'll go over the specific elements of the straw proposal that have been developed over the last several months through this process. And then we'll have a discussion. And uh, I'm really happy that our open air member, uh, Kasia Milokuk is uh, also on. You just heard her voice a couple minutes ago and she'll be helping out with the discussion as well. And she's uh, based in Stockholm. So thanks, Kasia. So just to get started, I know we have a lot of folks who registered. I saw a lot of familiar names on the RSVP list who are very familiar with carbon dioxide removal. 
Uh, this is a year, anybody who's been part of this space for some time, uh, it, it's fair to say it's been a momentous year. Uh, we've, we've really seen uh, the idea of carbon removal emerge from something that was incredibly obscure to something that is a bit more uh, center stage. Uh, so that, that I think we'll look back at 2021 uh, is the year that, that that corner was turned. And then in more concrete um, terms, this was also the year that Orca, uh, the first uh, commercially operating direct air capture plant uh, that removes carbon dioxide and stores it geologically, was commissioned in Iceland uh, in October. So that was a, a momentous moment uh, as well. The other thing that obviously that that sort of much of this progress is flowing from uh, is the just the the greater understanding that how broad the consensus is now that we need to be removing carbon dioxide over the remaining decades of the century, not just immediately stopping emissions, which we, we have to do as well as make investments in adaptation. Um, we have to remove, this is the consensus of the, the IPCC, and we can't, even though it becomes critically important for the atmosphere in later decades, in order to get to a point where carbon dioxide removal can really scale and be affordable, we have to be starting right now. So policy right now really, really matters. And if we look at a variety of different technologies, but one that is certainly a, 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 an important focus of open air and central to the carbon dioxide removal um, question, uh, if you look at direct air capture, for instance, um, what do we have to do in order to get uh, to a price where we can really envision this on a gigaton scale? Uh, $100 a ton is often the number that is cited. And here I'm just sharing, again, in the example of direct air capture, um, we have a long way to go to bring the price down uh, in order to um, get it to that level in terms of scale up, but it's achievable. And uh, here I'm referring to a, a widely read paper from uh, late last year by Klaus Lochner and Habib Azarabadi, where they estimated for direct air capture, we're looking at about um, 300,000 uh, ton uh, per year capacity uh, that we need to scale up to, to bring the price down to that $100 threshold. And so what we need to do, I think, which is critically important in our, our communications and strategy uh, around forms of engineered carbon dioxide removal, like direct air capture, is that this next decade that we're in right now is a defining one uh, as Fast Company, uh, or the rather uh, third derivative paper uh, recently put it, um, where we really have to scale up to achieve those, uh, those, those cost thresholds. And so the real key here for the next decade is prioritizing deployment by any means necessary um, over you know, how we measure the actual removal of carbon dioxide. So getting these units out into the world uh, is of utmost importance. And so that means CDR that's or carbon removal uh, solutions that are out there both to remove like Orca systems, that that's what they're purpose built for, but also various forms of utilization too, uh, using carbon for fuel and in materials and in the ag space as well, anything that is going to start to scale up that capacity and bring down the price. And so our policy proposal is, is really rooted in that understanding that right now we have to move quick and we have to have policies that are stimulating supply rapidly of carbon dioxide removal solutions that are currently expensive, uh, but need to be cheap in order to be relevant. And so the mission that we have here, if you just think about the overall goal of the Luxembourg tariff, what do we set out to do here? We wanna create a model policy that will stimulate, that will create demand to stimulate supply for, uh, for durable um, carbon dioxide removal technologies like direct air capture, but not exclusively direct air capture. We also are really committed, this is both an open air and certainly a pirate party um, uh, value to a transparent process of developing that policy, really casting a net to get as broad of an opinion in as possible um, and perspective in, including experts, but as well as a, a more broader public. And so at Open Air, we think of that as, a, as an open source policy uh, mechanism, uh, ways that we can, the more ideas, the more creativity that's brought in uh, to think through the policies, both as a concept and in detail, the better that policy will be. And that's what this method, the uh, collective intelligence relay, which I'll, I'll define for you in just a moment, is rooted in that goal, uh, open, uh, crowd-based um, uh, policymaking. And then the last part is it's not just about academically making the policy. As Sven said at the beginning, we, we our goal is to get the policy introduced as legislation and make it into law. And not just in Luxembourg, we look at Luxembourg as the tip of the spear, which is again why 
Sven uh, deserves a lot of credit here for bringing this idea into the European context, but we then want to adapt and spread it to other countries in the region and beyond um, viral policy. Um, we have sort of a, a saying, you know, if it's not moving, then it's not really happening. So we measure our success, not just by well-crafted policy, but turning that legislation into law as broadly as possible. And the specific policy goals that we came up with uh, for this, um, this really flows mostly from Sven is that, you know, again, we, we want to drive CDR deployment, not just to in year one, two, three, four and beyond to measure the amount of carbon that we're bringing out of the air, but to really play a catalytic market development role uh, to use Luxembourg policy and beyond to drive down the cost, to make real advances in how the technology is applied in the real world. Um, and another really important value, again, that, that really flowed from Sven, but is certainly shared by open air, is that we think a key piece of success uh, for any CDR policy is that we need to democratize and decentralize participation in CDR. That's investment, ownership, and how the benefits from CDR investment and realization are realized broadly. Uh, so that's a, that's a critical um, value or principle that you'll see reflected in the policy. And then, of course, you know, as we, we Sven said at the outset, there's many things we have to do to, to win uh, the, the, the climate battle or to solve this emergency. We know we have to uh, decarbonize as rapidly as possible. We need to make adaptation to inevitable climate change. But this creates a third pathway uh, that allows for uh, ways to attain uh, net zero targets in Luxembourg and beyond. So just to tell you how we got to where we, we are right now, I want to just quickly define the method, and then we're going to get into uh, the actual policy itself and then to the discussion. So this collective intelligence relay, and I want to give a shout out to, to Carbon 180. It's an organization that many of you know about. Uh, really, the first on the scene is a uh, carbon dioxide removal advocacy group, and I, I, I've been a consultant for them uh, on and off uh, over the years. And the idea of the CIR, CIR actually emerged uh, from a project of Carbon 180 internally. Uh, and we, so I just want to give the, the lineage there. And the way that this worked is, um, hopefully you can hear me, it's saying I'm having a little instability on the internet. So Cassia, definitely let me know if you, if you can't hear me. Um, but the way that this worked uh, was Sven and I connected, as he mentioned, uh, on open air. We started to exchange very high level ideas about what would a policy potentially look like that would be optimal. Uh, that was back in the summertime when we had a, our initial conversations, just me and him and a couple of other open air members. And that was where Sven uh, really sort of identified the, the feed-in tariff for renewable energy that was really pioneered by Germany and then uh, adopted and advanced in, in many different European countries and beyond was an important reference point. We thought that not only the success of that program and radically driving down the cost of renewable energy uh, technologies like solar for everyone uh, globally uh, could be traced to these policies, but the specific um, elements of the feed-in tariff we thought could be ad adapted and potentially applied to carbon dioxide removal and utilization, while acknowledging there's obviously gigantic differences between renewable energy and electricity and carbon removal. So we sort of took that as our starting point as can we, can we look at certain elements there and, and make adaptations. And the next phase really from the summer all the way through August was our research phase. We did a lot of reading. We did a lot of weekly discussions. Uh, we interviewed a, uh, a leading um, expert in the history of the feed-in tariff, Professor Jorn uh, Hopman, who wrote an excellent paper uh, a few years ago about the feed-in tariff and how it was uh, politically survived and um, how the different policy elements changed over time. And then we also engaged with um, uh, Professor Greg Nemet at the University of Madison in Wisconsin, a leading innovation scholar who really followed the history of solar and how solar became so cheap and has a book of the same name. And we did a kickoff webinar announcing our intention to develop this uh, policy and, and Professor Nemet was on there and shared some more insights. So that got us a little bit further along in terms of what we thought the main pieces would be. And then the real core of a collective intelligence relay are expert roundtables that after our kickoff webinar once a week, we would have uh, groups of three or four people uh, join us on an hour long call where we would talk about different elements of the policy as it was uh, developing um, and get people's feedback. And we invited entrepreneurs in the CDR and DAC space, people in the investment community, very well-known uh, folks in the science community like Klaus Lochner, 
and leading advocates. Uh, Eli Mitchell Larson from Carbon Gap joined. Uh, Erica Dodds, who's the um, one of the founders of the Foundation for Climate uh, Restoration. And through that process, we would develop and keep putting more flesh on the bones of the idea and like a relay, pass it from group to group. Then we posted that actually publicly uh, on, a, on a platform uh, called Your Priorities, where we invited other people to also add additional ideas or nuances to some of the ideas that were being discussed in those roundtables. And that brought us to where we are right now. Uh, this is our straw proposal, what we're going to uh, lay out for you um, today uh, for your input, but it's not the end of the process either. Um, what we are going to enter into uh, right after uh, today, after the webinar, is a two-week window where yourself and folks, uh, anyone who's interested, can actually submit additional ideas um, related to the elements of the straw proposal, what they think could maybe improve it, something we maybe didn't think about, why it's not a good idea uh, is definitely fair game. And then we're going to take all of that information and continue to develop the idea. And then, as Sven said, we're going right into drafting. So after that two-week period, uh, Sven and his team are going to go ahead and draft up legislation uh, based on the, uh, the, the final idea that we've, we've come up with. And then he's going to introduce it in February or March. So this will be a live legislation. And then comes the fun part is the mobilization both within Luxembourg um, to uh, try to educate lawmakers uh, and uh, civil society and the public on the strengths of this bill and the rationale behind it. And then um, we're also going to, as I said before, simultaneously try to spread that policy, uh, not shoehorn the same policy into every other place, but adapt it to the local context. And one of the things that we've learned from people like Professor Nemet with renewable energy, um, we were able to get the pricing down for solar and wind, uh, but we, it took a long time. And one of the reasons why that was is there was sort of a linear progression of good favorable policies that move from sort of country to country and state to state. We can't do that with CDR. We need to be working simultaneously. So when we say viral policy, we wanna get this going fast and we wanna get it going now, starting with Luxembourg. So now just to go over the actual elements of the straw proposal, uh, one by one, and then again, I promise we'll stop. We'll do a little bit of Q&A, but as I just mentioned that your priorities two week period, whatever we don't get to, the idea is, is please turn your attention to that. I'll give you a little bit of direction on how to use it. It's quite intuitive and simple and have at it. We want uh, ideas as long as they're, they're relevant and related to the subject. Uh, we want you to, to share those with us to, to make this policy better. Um, so this policy has eight uh, really core elements, um, which I'll go over right now. Uh, the key one, again, I, I'm going to refer to where we were directly inspired by the, uh, the, the feed-in tariff and as well as other policies. But a key thing that we learned about the feed-in tariff that made it successful is that you need to have relatively open participation uh, so that the opportunity here is not just captured uh, through a, for a limited number of actors. Um, and so what, what we're looking at here is CDR developers that um, have projects that they can develop that follow the guidelines of the program, which we'll flesh out a little bit more, will receive payment for removing uh, uh, and either utilizing or storing uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, you're paid on the basis of, 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 of those, um, uh, whether you, you utilize or, or you remove. Uh, so that's a lot like the feed-in tariff where folks could interconnect with the grid, sell their solar electrons to the grid and get paid for it. And what they're getting paid for is it's not like an upfront tax credit, it's performance based. So you're getting paid for the carbon. Uh, we're following the carbon here. Um, that's it's, it's based on the, the, the tons of carbon uh, that are being drawn down. Um, we also, and this really sort of flows from the goal of making sure that a lot of people can participate, including small distributed types of projects, is that we're going to add uh, floors. There'll be a certain you know, minimum size project that's eligible that'll actually be quite low. Um, and then there'll be a cap on the maximum size uh, project as well. So we'll sort of give parameters for uh, the size projects uh, in terms of the amount of CO2 that they can draw down. Um, and then the last part is we'll refer back to this in the, the end and when we talk about the funding mechanism is that uh, projects, as long as they meet that criteria, they're in. Uh, they, they, can, they can sign up and, and get paid, but there is going to be a cap as we'll talk about the funding mechanism. There'll be a certain limited pool 
of funds that'll be available. And when that's exhausted, then new subscribers will have to wait for the following year. Now, in terms of the tariff, again, this draws directly from a feed-in tariff model is that you need to differentiate for different types of uh, applications is the way that the feed-in tariff works. So solar rooftop or utility or wind, small or large or offshore would get different amounts of money that they would get paid for their kilowatt hours. So we think we need to differentiate uh, our tariff as well, but in, in a somewhat different way that's more appropriate for an even newer technology that's quite different uh, like carbon removal technologies such as direct air capture. So here we're looking at something like a, what we call a, a value stack, a carbon value stack, where there's different uh, sort of tiers uh, that depending on the type of project, you, you'll get different payments and they're not mutually exclusive. So the first stack that, that is the qualifying one is that you had to have captured carbon dioxide from the air. This is not avoided emissions from point sources. This is pulling carbon from the air. So that's one stack that a certain uh, amount of, of euros will correspond per ton. And then if you're permanently storing, if this is a durable minimum 100 year storage, then you're in line for another stack, a larger stack of money that goes on top of that layer one. And then we have a third stack, which is to be determined really will we'll either go into the legislation or be worked out through the rules that there might be other benefits that we want to strategically prioritize that come, whether it's job creation or, or other things that could constitute a, a third uh, layer of the stack that could you know, change over time, depending on what the political priorities are. So that's what we mean by a carbon stack. And you can see there'd be a variety of different ways of uh, stacking, uh, depending on what your application that would command uh, different uh, levels of payment. Now, the other thing that we're, could be integrated into the stack or it might be a separate mechanism is that we um, want to, again, make sure that smaller types of projects uh, can be permitted. So just like the feed-in tariff, there will likely be an adjustment to compensate for smaller projects uh, that will have you know, likely higher costs, uh, uh, particularly early on compared to, to larger projects. Uh, so that's one key principle that we want to write into the law. Um, the third part is uh, piece is multi-year contracts. Again, this is just like the feed-in tariff. One of the things that really made the feed-in tariff work is not, not just that you could interconnect with the grid and get paid, but that you knew that you'd have a contract where you'd be uh, get paid uh, over a certain period of time. So that created an enormous amount of certainty for an investor and made the cost of capital cheap. Feed-in tariffs typically had a 15 or 20-year period. Um, we think for carbon dioxide removal, that's too long. There could be perverse uh, side effects of that that we want to avoid. So we're looking at a five-year fixed contract uh, that would probably be a richer per year to make sure that you get a, a good return on your investment within that uh, period of time. Um, but the reason why we want to do five years, and here we were inspired by a few different thinkers, but but Lochner and, and uh, Azarabadi, I think, give a compelling uh, sort of case for this is that it's still such a young technology where we're going to see a lot of improvement and change very, very rapidly. So we don't want to lock into a 20-year contract on something where we might have a high degree of obsolescence, where you have a lot of improvement year after year. So we're looking at a shorter <clears throat> five-year uh, term uh, in order to avoid that. And then thirdly, again, as, as we said, it's, it's performance-based. So you're getting paid uh, for the tons that you're removing, not just for having installed uh, the system. And we think that would probably be payments would be reconciled on a monthly basis, but we'll have to see. It could be, could be uh, other, other time increments. would like your input on that. The fourth part uh, is a volumetric tariff digression. So basically that just means the tariff should go down over time. Uh, that doesn't mean for people who sign up in year one and get that certain price that they're locked into, uh, they're going to get that price for the duration of their contract. But for, for over time, for new entrants, that, that is going to go down uh, over time. And what we decided to do, rather than having a sort of an arbitrary, you know, every year it goes down by a certain percent, we don't think that that is sensitive enough to inevitable but unpredictable market changes and technology changes. So instead, we're going to go with a, a block type of structure uh, where over time, you're going to have a certain amount that's available uh, at a certain uh, uh uh, value. And then once projects have come in uh, and subscribed to that, uh, and that's fully subscribed, that will then go down uh, by a, a certain increment, which, you know, to be determined. I uh, would love your input on that. But we think that the, the reduction actually in that should be something that's subject to constant market analysis rather than, again, 
giving a fixed and somewhat arbitrary number. We need to be looking at what's actually happening in the marketplace and adjust those blocks accordingly. Um, we think that this block where you know that it's going to go down over time uh, is also going to really incentivize those early actors, uh, reward, uh, you know, reward early movers. You, you get the higher prices early on. Um, and then we think we should also give visibility on what the, the next block will look like in terms of how those are going down, but not too much further because again, we wanna adjust those block prices based on, uh, you know, if we have a radically radical reductions in price uh, more faster than, than projections, then the, the, uh, the new block should reflect those realities um, so that we don't um, overpay. Um, uh, and that's that's a key thing that we learned from the feed-in tariff is you don't want, you know, you want to avoid windfall profits where if a technology can be installed much cheaper, we don't want to overpay for it and be fixed uh, with those with those payments for a long period of time. Having digression also pushes the private sector to keep trying to lower cost as well. Going into the fifth one here, um, this is kind of an interesting part, uh, I think, of the policy where we we look at it's it's technology agnostic, but certain parameters. Um, really kind of favor uh, certain types of technologies. And the way that payment is, is going to be structured is on what we call a CO2 chain of custody. Um, and it, it's really about where is, what's happening to the carbon dioxide that's being removed, that's being transported, that's being used, uh, or that's being stored. And uh, your, your payment is based on your ability to really track uh, CO2 as a physical thing. Um, so it favors technologies that uh, and solutions that can really meter the CO2, uh, where you're able to track how much carbon is being taken out, where is it going, and how much of it is being uh, stored, rather than solutions where you you arrive at that by proxy. Um, you know where you can you know assess that you know studies show that carbon you know is going to be removed from a certain plot of land. Here, here it really matters um, that we're able to see the carbon, uh, so to speak. Um, and then the sixth, uh, almost wrapping up here, um, is that the key thing that made it work for the feed-in tariff, uh, although its popularity uh, went up and down, is that you have to know how you're going to pay for it. Uh, you have to have a funding stream that's sort of built into the program. Uh, with the feed-in tariff for electricity, that was a small uh, rate payer fee that was applied to uh, electricity bills. And so it paid for itself as it went along. The, the renewable energy premiums were paid through those fees. Here, uh, we're looking at a different type of mechanism, which would be based on modifications to an existing tax that Luxembourg already has. It's a, Sven can go into this in greater detail. It's basically a, a tax on wealth or an investments that already exist. It's a, a half a percentage point tax that in aggregate raises a, quite a significant amount of money. So what we're proposing here is to add another 0.1%, 1 to that tax, which sounds small, but in a country like Luxembourg, which is a sort of a finance capital, it re, capital it really adds up. And again, Sven can give some of the, the projections on what that pot of money might look like. That additional uh, application, uh, on particularly on investments that are in high emission sectors, including oil and gas, is going to raise a pot of money that can be used uh, for uh, each year um, to pay for these uh, these premiums. And at the same time, it's also a, a tax on investment in, in, in oil and gas, uh, which is good in its own right. Uh, and then, as I said uh, earlier, um, you, we'd be capped. Once that, that pot of money is uh, fully subscribed, then you have to wait till the next year and we have another pot of money uh, in order uh, you know, to participate. And then the other part too, really, really important is you know, Luxembourg is a physically a, a small country, uh, but potentially could raise quite a bit of resources uh, to invest uh, or to support CDR projects through the mechanism we're describing. So we do want to have a conditional eligibility for projects outside uh, of Luxembourg, almost like a low carbon fuel standard to, to open up uh, a broader uh, territory for projects to be developed, which is also good because outside of Luxembourg, uh, you know, you're going to have uh, a, a greater variety of carbon removal uh, and carbon utilization possibilities. Um, the we're putting some parameters around that. I'm going to list all of the ones that we're considering. Whether all of them are the parameters we don't know yet, so we're looking forward to getting your feedback. It could be one or some combination of them, but one that we're really drawn to is to outside projects have to be removals. They can't be utilizations. Uh, so that's going to 
uh, immediately have a, uh, a a real impact on you know Luxembourg's performance in terms of its its net zero uh, targets. So outside projects would be removals, not utilizations. Um, we also want to make sure that a single project doesn't suck up all of the the available funds. So we want to capture cap that at outside projects at 10,000 tons uh, per year, which is about double, uh, slightly more than double uh, the ORCA project uh, in Iceland for reference, for looking at a DAC project. Um, we also, um, there has to be a minimum investment, uh, whether it's subscriptions from uh, Luxembourgers, almost like a, a community solar model or direct investment uh, by uh, businesses that are domiciled in, um, uh, in Luxembourg, uh, that a certain percentage will have to be tied to Luxembourg itself. Uh, and then again, we want to probably have uh, a certain percentage that maxes out, whether it's 30% or 20% that can be external projects. Um, th that remains to be seen. We'll have to continue to figure out. And then the last part, um, which Sven can give uh, more color to, is that we think there's a real opportunity here, given the dominance of the financial sector and investment in Luxembourg, uh, to create some incentives uh, for this here, um, where we uh, would, would create for, for special purpose vehicles related to CDR that are domiciled in Luxembourg, they would be exempt uh, from income and wealth. So this would help attract those types of SBVs, uh, SBVs to Luxembourg. Um, and then income that's generated from projects, uh, CDR projects uh, would be taxed actually at, at half the effective tax rate for CDR projects. And then funds that are investing uh, in CDR um, will we'll see their, 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 uh, that tax rate that's the funding source for this would actually be reduced um, to uh, uh, less than half of what that, uh, that rate is for, for most eligible investments. So that sort of sweetens the pot from an investment point of view and then really leverages a, a key sector in, in Luxembourg. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop and we're going to take some uh, questions and, and Kasi is going to help uh, lead us through that. Great, Kasi, are we, uh, are we seeing some good questions come in? We are, and feel free to add more questions, uh, but we'll start with the first one. So this one's for Sven. Uh, which countries would you expect to follow Luxembourg's policy model? Is there a history of climate policy partnerships with Luxembourg? Well, uh, first of all, I think that it's an excellent question. And um, sure. given that Luxembourg is so small, we have uh, huge experience in being facilitators and coordinators of uh, multilateral um, agreements. Uh, our minister for um, ecology and uh, is normally at the COPS um, one of the lead coordinators for at least one of the chapters that is being negotiated. So um, we have some experience in, in talking to other countries. Uh, when it comes to specific countries, um, we have partnerships with the Benelux countries, so the Netherlands and uh, Belgium, uh, simply because of um, our um, closeness, uh, not only culturally, but also geographically. Then uh, we have huge projects with Denmark in uh, wind farming um, and with Finland in importing um, green energy from um, hydroelectric power plants. So obviously those two countries would fit the bill as well to be interested in or where we have an open door at least. And finally, um, our direct neighbors are France and Germany. And um, given that um, something that happens across the border is always closer than something that happens across the world, um, it might mean that we have good um, also an open door to, towards those countries. I personally will be uh, meeting with a lot of French officials um, at the end of February, beginning of March, um, through a program developed by um, the French Foreign Ministry, where foreign members of parliament with uh, who have promising careers ahead of them or whatever they mean by that, um, are meeting with uh, French uh, politicians, uh, MPs, but also ministers. And obviously I want to use that um, as uh, an entry point as well. So um, we're looking first of all at European countries and then hopefully uh, spreading it from there. Uh, a bit like the, the feed-in tariffs um, spread from, from some obscure um, Alpine villages in Bavaria um, 
to the world um, and how uh, data protection laws uh, originated in, in Europe and spread uh, across the world. So uh, we have some experience with that and I hope to leverage that. That's great. That's a lot, a lot of um, connections that we can, we can build on right out of, off the bat. Uh, yeah, Kasper, before we proceed real quick, I didn't know Sven, I was, I was going to ask just based on the presentation there, I didn't know if you had any initial comments uh, as well um, or anything to add that was maybe left out or you'd want to dig um, deep. Yeah, well, I, I think um, we can um, we can go through the questions. So I, I think a few of them are really, really interesting. Uh, a few of them are comments. Uh, so I think that we can address them or Kasia can address them uh, summarily. Um, one quick comment maybe on the, the accent on, on the finance sector. Um, Chris mentioned it, Luxembourg is a small country. We have not a lot of natural resources, so um, we don't have that much space to put all those CDR projects uh, inside of our nat national borders. Uh, and in my honest opinion, it's clear that CDR is not a national issue. So we need to find ways to internationalize it from the get-go and find solutions where we can bring partner countries uh, on board as quickly as possible. Um, given our experience with financial markets, it makes sense to carve out that niche as well for Luxembourg. But um, obviously I expect other countries to follow that as well and in, introduce tax exemptions for CDR projects in, in the short time. Um, and in the midterm to maybe uh, find more innovative solutions than simply um, uh, being uh, reducing the tax burden. Um, just a quick note, uh, the, those 0.02% uh, wealth tax on uh, CDR projects, it's the same tax rate that is currently applied to funds uh, that are labeled green under the European taxonomy. So, um, Knowing that you only need to have 50% plus one share in um, green shares to be able to call yourself a green fund and the uh, remaining 49 point something percent can be um, uh, invested in total energies or shell or BP. Um, you, you see that I prefer to use that tax rate for CDR projects that are clearly green instead of uh, having some greenwashed uh, funds uh, running ar around in the world and claiming to be green. Great. Um, that Thanks. was maybe the, the, the remark I, I just wanted to get off my chat. Yeah, chat I'm glad you did as well, because that was the one that I skipped over the quickest. So sorry, go ahead, uh, proceed, Kasia. Great. Uh, so the next one is, how do, you, how do you communicate to the public on where the captured carbon is going to be stored and how it relates to the local le legislations? What are the risks? Um, well, maybe I, I start with how we communicate with the public and uh, Chris, if you want, if I miss something on the risks, you, you are free to, to add on to that. Um, yeah, you, it, you it depends on how, how we use the carbon. And, and um, I, I think in the chat, we, there was already a small discussion about uh, utilization can be permanent if we are using it for cement uh, or concrete. Uh, obviously, it is that might qualify as permanent or semi-permanent. We, we are looking at, uh, I think it's the Oxford uh, scale of, of permanency. So we will um, certainly have different uh, categories of, of permanency uh, in, in the build proposal. Um, when we store it or if we store it uh, permanently, um, there are multiple ways to do it and we are tech agnostic. So we are not saying in the law, it needs to be stored a certain way. So uh, communicating that will be difficult, but I expect it to be at least as hard fought than uh, landfills for inert uh, building um, uh, waste. So it will not be organic waste. It will be easier to handle and to explain, but it will still need space, uh, whether it's underground or above ground. And, um, there will be NIMBY initiatives around that as well. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, I don't have a final answer on how we get around that. Yeah, 
I, I think uh, one thing I'm posting right now in the thing is a, um, uh, a presentation I gave just a couple of days ago for open air about um, uh, car carbon dioxide removal and concrete, which I, I do think is a extremely exciting, very permanent uh, form of removal um, that could be implemented in Luxembourg itself. I've, uh, make concrete everywhere. So it's correct, as, as, as Rob Niven uh, mentioned, that that utilization can be permanent. And certainly at the tip of the spear of that is concrete. And that could be something that could be an early type of project um, in Luxembourg. Um, I think a really key thing is this messaging, which is a challenging one where, which I tried to get out at the beginning of the presentation, is that we need to somehow impress upon people that the immediate goal is to try to make these technologies viable economically, to try to drive down the price. So we don't want to get entirely um, focused on the removal of the carbon that's coming out from day one, but rather what can Luxembourg and other countries do, like the feed-in tariff in Germany, to implement a policy that not only increases the amount of carbon removal, but drives down the cost. So you know, really looking forward to input on that and are your priorities about the best way to communicate that because it does have a couple of pieces to it. But I think the public needs to understand that's the sort of heroic role we're playing right now is getting this technology out in the real world. And that means utilization and that also means removal. But at the same time, as the differentiated tariff structure they're proposing is you want to value removal and permanent storage more than utilization. Um, uh, just for the long-term benefit to climate, um, but also presumably in most utilization scenarios, there's value of that carbon and the, the tariff wouldn't need to be as high um, anyway. So it's a challenge around communication, but one that we have to get right. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Great. So the next one is about co-benefits. So tell us more about the co-benefits section of the tariff. Yeah, that one's kind of open. This has changed a little bit. We had a, a tariff stack that was a little bit different before where we had transportation as its own distinct layer and we might revisit that. In fact, I would like people's input on that. We had layer two is if presumably there's a cost that comes with transporting CO2 uh, that you might want to reflect or embed within a tariff, but that could create a per perverse you know, uh, sort of incentive where suddenly you're getting paid more for, you know, uh, dislocating the removal and, and the storage where you don't necessarily have to do that. Like Orca, for instance, uh, stores in basalt right on site. So, but co-benefits were sort of drawing off of what we're doing in the United States at open air with our Carbon Removal Leadership Act policy, which has some similarities. It's a procurement policy that's being, it's already been introduced in New York state and we're working on several other states where you wanna build into the scoring if a solution does other things that we want economically or for society or for the climate or for the earth, um, can that be reflected in the tariff? So with the CRLA, we're looking at job creation, are there quantifiable ecological benefits? And that's really a question for, for Luxembourg and for Sven uh, in terms of what that looks like. Um, you know, what are the real priorities? And if it turns out that there's not enough there, then maybe there isn't that layer three, but I think it's certainly worth the discussion at this point. I don't have to add anything to what Chris said. It's uh, very complete. Um, it, it would be interesting to, to add co-benefits, but uh, those, those layers are still up for, for negotiation, I, I want to say. I think uh, in the end, they might also um, be a chip we are willing to trade in order to get the law passed. Um, we are well aware that um, political realities always um, will not always lead to the scientifically soundest solution. And it's nowhere as true than in, in climate policy. So while I might prefer to have the soundest policy uh, initially, I think that we need to have some um, leeway and some chips that we can trade in order to get it passed. And co-benefits could be an interesting part where we can incentivize current stakeholders of a carbon-based um, industry to play a role in carbon removal. Um, I, I think that's uh, what Chris meant with transportation as an element where uh, companies that are currently already uh, have the infrastructure to transport uh, either gas or uh, solids or, or liquids can uh, compete for a part or a, a piece of, the, of that uh, pie. If, 
that is something that makes the law more palatable to um, the stakeholders in Luxembourg, then that might be something that we are willing to do. But it's not something that we are actively pushing at this point, except if the feedback here would, would say otherwise. Cassie, if I could just intervene, because we went, we started late, and I know we're, we're going towards the end of the hour. We're, we're going to do an extra five, like 10 minutes total, an extra five minutes after the hour. Um, just some housekeeping notes for those who have to jump. Anybody who registered for this event, we're sending out by email the video of this, as well as, I think it's already been shared, but the link uh, to the Your Priorities platform, uh, as well as with some instructions. What I'm also noticing is the chat here, which I'm looking at is fantastic. Uh, Eli, Nick, uh, Billy, it's a great conversation uh, unto itself. Uh, we have the ability to share that chat, and I'm actually going to share that with everybody as well uh, in the email. So you'll have ample opportunity to continue giving input um, for the next two weeks and beyond. Um, so I just wanted to leave it at that. Um, Sven, could you just maybe for two minutes, if you can, you just kind of alluded to it about just the political reality. I think one of the things you've talked very eloquently about about Luxembourg is that there's a lot of cohesion there. Uh, it seems like it's a country that gets things done. And I don't know if that's cultural or has to do with its size, but that's a real advantage there. Could you just in a minute or so kind of sketch out what the politics might be around a policy like this? Well, well, um, we also had um, people trying to storm our parliament uh, a few weeks back uh, because of the COVID measures. So um, I, I maybe not, <laughs> not, no, not uh, if, if you are sitting in glass houses, not, not throwing stones is normally a good idea. But uh, in, in general, Luxembourg politics are very consensual and uh, we are trying to, to get things done. And especially when it comes to the, the big issues at hand. Um, uh, no, Eli, it wasn't on January 6th, but it was a few, a few weeks back. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I know that our police was ready today as well, uh, simply because of the symbolic date. Um, the political reality is that we have a strong Green Party uh, who are currently in government, who, are, uh, who have one of the vice uh, prime ministers. So um, there is definitely a need to talk about um, green and, and nature and climate change and all those issues interconnect somehow. And it's not something that is only linked to one party anymore. Every party in Luxembourg with maybe the exception of one fringe party uh, accepts the reality of man-made climate change. So we have a, a 56 to uh, four majority in parliament to accept man-made uh, climate change as a fact, which means that um, if we are talking about climate change, there's no doubt that we need to change things. We have already a CO2 tax. Um, it's not nearly high enough. It's uh, currently at around 60 euros. It had a 20 euro hike on uh, January 1st. Um, so we have about 60 euro uh, tax per ton of CO2 when it comes to uh, gas, uh, diesel, and, um, and fuels in general. Um, so there is that consensus that we need and we can change something. And it also means that even as opposition a politician, we can push something forward which might end up in a actually voted law. It's not something that's unheard of. It's rare, I admit that, but it's not unheard of. And we have experience with um, being a financial sector. And this is a problem where we need to mobilize the capital to reduce costs first. And I think the Lackner paper um, that Chris mentioned initially about driving costs down has a second graph in it that is um, saying even a bit more that means how much money needs to be mobilized to uh, drive the cost down. And if we can help with that, um, Luxembourg will punch above its weight. And that's something that we can do in very few specific policy areas. And climate change and fighting climate change is definitely one of those areas that is a focus for Luxembourg politics as a whole, for me personally, but um, for, for Luxembourg as a whole. And thus, we are very hopeful that uh, we can be the, a beacon or a, a lighthouse uh, when it comes to uh, CDR policies. 
Excellent. Really well said. Um, Kasi, I think we should do one more question. Again, we'll keep the conversation going. And then I just want to give a little bit of instruction on what's next, which will take about two minutes. So let's do one more question. Great. Yeah, we have a lot of great questions. So yeah, you can keep the conversation going in your priorities. I'll share the link again. But one last question. Um, it's a multi-part question, but um, who will own the carbon removal? Will projects be allowed to sell into various carbon markets for extra profits? If so, will they be allowed to transfer the credits outside of Luxembourg for NDC purposes? What about projects sitting in other countries? Yeah, well, I, I think that's exactly what uh, Chris uh, already said. And um, all the other questions, um, maybe it would be good if we can copy them over to your priorities and um, I can try to give written answers over the next days to, to most of them. Um, to, to this question in, in particular, um, yes, obviously you, you have a choice. You, you can either sell the carbon credits to Luxembourg um, through the subsidized uh, mechanism, mm. or you can decide to sell them on, on secondary markets if you can make more money uh, out of that. I would really like uh, secondary markets to exist and, and show us that the subsidies are uh, not needed because there is a market that is willing to pay more than, than a public stakeholder. Um, this obviously depends on, on market dynamics that are way out of the control of any single country. And uh, uh, so that would be um, very interesting to see whether those markets will exist. Uh, when they are being transferred out of Luxembourg, um, they will be accounted and with all the intricacies of Article 6 and with all the problems uh, linked to that would be accounted in the country that would buy them at the higher, um, at the higher rate. So um, I guess that uh, because in that sense, Luxembourg wouldn't finance those uh, tons of, of CO2 removal. Um, that would be at least my very basic understanding. Maybe Chris, you have something more to say yeah. about that? I mean, I think it's, while it's it's an unconventional and novel mechanism, it, it should functionally be considered, um, you know, there wouldn't be double dipping. This is enough, you know, basically like a, a carbon credit type of program that I, I don't see any other secondary market, uh, you know, just on the basis of additionality would, you know, reward funds to, uh, you know, for a project that's receiving the feed-in tariff um, rates. But we'll, we're going to have to figure out how those align and or at least rhyme with or don't cause chaos and confusion uh, with those secondary markets or with the carbon markets. So, but let's, let's, you know, whether it makes it into legislation that we have to spell that out, not likely, but we need smart answers for all of these questions in advocating for it. And certainly during the rulemaking phase, we do. So please let's consider um, adding your thoughts and your ideas about this very point uh, in the your priorities. Um, and I think that's a good segue. We're, we're at five minutes after the hour. Uh, first, I wanna thank all of you for joining. Really wanna thank Cassia for stage managing and then running the, the Q&A and certainly Sven for getting us to where we are. Uh, I think this is an extremely exciting project and keep bearing in mind, this is the key part. This is an open air project, which means it's an activist project. We're not, this is not an academic question. This is a thing that we want to make as good as possible and to make it into a law as fast as possible and as broadly as possible. So just on that last note, if you can bear with me while I just share two more quick slides. Um, with the your priorities, it's pretty intuitive uh, how that works if you go to that link. Um, it's basically just allows you for each of the different policy components we have, you can add a point, you can use video, you can use audio, uh, and you can also put a point against. If you think it's a bad idea, tell us why. We want people to kick the tire. We want, we want, we want this to be um, put under a microscope. So what I'm going to do is with the recording of this, um, I'm going to slice up the relevant parts of video for those solutions and attach those to it within the your priorities to make it even a little bit more easy for you to refer to. But please go ahead and fill out uh, the ideas that you have in that and share that link, uh, particularly once it has the video embedded. I'd love to have it as broad as possible. Let's really try to get a um, a uh, you know get a, a crowd effect uh, really sort of take place. And then the other thing is we put multiple times the join open air. If you're interested in supporting this effort in Luxembourg uh, and beyond Luxembourg as an activist, our method is a citizen lobbying 
uh, method uh, that we're using quite effectively in the United States and in other areas. We want you to be involved. Uh, we want you to lead. It's an all volunteer initiative. So be in touch. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. But this is an extremely exciting mission. And again, I want to thank everybody for joining and looking forward to carrying this conversation and effort on, uh, on Discord and your priorities. So thanks so much. Thank you.